Hey, everybody. Happy Sunday and welcome to episode seven of the Stock Trading Pit. Today's agenda is going to be four segments as always. Segment one is going to be talking with traders. Dan goes over um, how Adrian, aka CryptoBurb, got into trading, how he trades, and also about his indicator, the Burbicator. Segment two is going to be the broad market recap. We go over SPY, QQQ, IWM, and VIX. Segment three is going to be the watch list. I go over a few different charts with Mike from Market Traders TV. They're really more focused on Twitch, but they are on Twitter as well. And segment four is going to be the weekend chart request. We're going to go over five different requested charts um, from earlier this week. So sit back, relax, and let's get started. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another segment of Talking with Traders, where we get to meet the people behind the trades. Today, I've got a great guest, Adrian Zadunchik, or as you may know him on social media as the Crypto Burb. Adrian, thanks for being here today. Yeah. Hey, Dan. I hope you guys, hope you guys are doing okay. And uh, well done on pronunciating my, my surname. <laughs> That's a great job. I try. Um, you know, there's <laughs> a, a, I spent maybe an hour and a half practicing. Uh, just kidding. <laughs> I, can, I can believe that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so uh, let's let's get into it. Um, you know, thank you again for being here. Um, you know, for those watching, uh, Adrian focuses a lot on crypto, so we're going to talk a lot about crypto today. But let's start at the basics. Um, what brought you to trading, Adrian? How'd you get your start? Um, the actual origins, you know, for for me getting into the crypto. I mean, there was this passive side and the active side to the story. And the passive side started actually, you know, just somewhere around uh, 2013 and 14 when I was actually in my uh, studies, you know, at the Warsaw School, Warsaw University of Technology, the Polytechnics, well known, uh, where I was doing my chemical technology department. And, uh, you know, I had a lot of friends. I had a lot of friends back then who were dealing with IT, with programming, you know, they were coders, programmers, and so on and so forth. And, you know, all of a sudden, one day, they would like Bitcoin was pretty much like in the mouth of every everybody, right? And, uh, well, of course, this was because of the end Gox, right? Monty Gox pretty much like collapsed the hack. And dude, dude, it's all, all, all the, my colleagues, you know, were like, dude, like, did you hear about what Bitcoin did? Like, it's just crashed, you know, it's done, it's it, it's dying, right? And, uh, but I was watching, you know, I, I actually looked up what that is because I actually had no idea what that is, what I was back then. And, uh, well, I was like, okay, that's fine. I mean, doesn't bother me at all, right? I just, I'm just back to studying because that's what I had to do. So uh, it hadn't been until 2011, actually, early, uh, March and April, when I was uh, running this sort of like uh, e-commerce startup with my friend, who is actually also a crypto influencer on Twitter. And uh, we were doing this sort of, sort of sort of like a smart box, you know, for smart gadgets, you know, subscription boxes where we would put some, some smart gadgets like LED lighters, you know, that would be so strong and powerful. Uh, enough that it could light up the fire, you know, with, with that. So it was like full of a lot of this, this, this gadgets. We were, you know, pretty much like going all over the Europe to Switzerland to also uh, search for the fundraisers and, and so on and so forth. But he one day decided that uh, crypto, you know, appeared on the stage because of the Alcons rallies and that he decided to dedicate a full time into that. And then I was pretty much like left all alone in the startup and I was like, okay, let's try Alcons, right? Let's try crypto, let's try Bitcoin. And uh, Bitcoin was trading, as far as I can remember, you know, uh, 1300 or something like this. Uh, so beautiful times. Um, and that's that's exactly, you know, early, early 2017 that I actually got involved actively into crypto trading. And uh, yeah, I've been st staying ever since. Okay. So before you were trading it, you were just investing in it, right? Buy and hold or hodl? <laughs> Yeah. So before, so before trading, I was uh, I was not necessarily dealing much with finance because, as I said, my main primary focus was on the chemical de not technology, pretty much like you know this were like the top league you know studies in my country. Uh, so we it, it was pretty time consuming, you know, nerves consuming, and so on and so forth. So mm -hmm. wouldn't leave, wouldn't you know leave up much time left for for trading alone. And uh, you know, I I actually was involved in uh, in more or less currency trading. You know, it wasn't necessarily like Forex per se, because it wasn't like oh, uh, on the on the exchange, right? But at the I started being, um, I started getting familiarized with the actual, you know, just idea of exchanging the currencies, you know, the of the rates and how it all works back in 2016, right? Like a year, I think not slightly less than a year, you know, before I actually got actively trading in crypto, yeah. 
Okay. How'd you go? How'd you get into technical analysis? Like what told you that um, you should pay attention to the charts? Yeah. So technical analysis, um, this is actually, you know, a very interesting study. I myself, I'm a certified technical analyst. I'm actually in my, in the midway of my getting the full sort of like, uh, like this, this exclusive designation from the CMT association from charter market technicians. I'm actually for my appreciate it actually graduated, graduated with the second level out of three. And the third one is coming uh, in June, right? Uh, and this entire study, you know, as the, as, the, as the field of, you know, of part of economics, let's say of the financial world, to some very, uh, you know, extent, uh, it has, it is very interesting because it has as many believers as disbelievers, right? You would see many people like seeing some fancy lines on their charts and and like squiggle lines, you know, and curves, and they will like go like, oh, like the price must touch this 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 line because you know otherwise technical analysis doesn't work and it's trash, right? Well, actually, you know, uh, over the time, over the time, I was able to to rationalize that much more, and uh, and apparently technical analysis is much much more complex study than than majority would expect, and. Uh, Actually, while preparing for my second designation exam uh, for the CMT, um, I found this amazing this amazing report. You know, this more of a scientific approach, scientific method of analyzing with the technical analysis, which pretty much like combines the overall philosophic, uh, like philosophy, you know, logics, of course, um, and and pretty much like introduces the actual scientific, like research, let's say, examination to whether or not technical analysis actually helps you know traders be become profitable and uh there are two schools you know the two two or three schools the efficient market hypothesis believers who would say that markets are efficient and those would say that ta traders are pretty much like nothing else but just the noise traders that technical analysis doesn't work that is it doesn't give you any sort of like privilege but uh what the studies you know have shown pretty much so far is that it's quite opposite that people are nowhere near rational. They are actually most of the time irrational. And, uh, and because they use technical analysis, you know, because they use patterns, uh, that's their only sort of like way to go about the future, right? By applying what they know from the past. And apparently, you know, uh, actually the research showed that uh, human brains are, are pretty much like, you know, dosed with, the, uh, with some amounts of, um, of the dopamine hormone, the happiness hormone. Right. Whenever we recognize patterns, so it works on a similar basis to, that you pretty much like you know just tune uh, the you know deep learning machines like the machine learnings you know the AI the the um, the neural networks right that you teach the machine uh, and then actually you know just uh, learn the, the, so that the machine is able to learn the entire process. But most important and essential part is that. It all started, uh, of course, getting by getting inspired by some people on, on Twitter, where I was new when I was not really necessarily not so widely known just just back then. And I decided, okay, like I can apply some lines to the chart, and apparently, you know, from time to time it works, right? And how on earth, you know, when I when I draw a line in a chart, chart listens to that. Like, how does that happen? You know. Mm -hmm. And then I started studying deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper, which led me to the place where I actually am right now and uh, trying to pretty much like bring the rational where majority of the people cannot apply the technical analysis properly. You're right, too. Um, in, in a lot of ways, uh, the, the schools of uh, I'm pro technical analysis and against it are very religious right you know oh, yeah. either like there's not a lot of people in the middle i'm kind of in the middle like yes there's there's some things that don't work so great and you mix strategies but a lot mm -hmm. of people are very religious what i find interesting um is i have a lot of friends at big banks you know jp morgan citibank um you know uh, in their at their trade desks um and they have teams of people dedicated to technical analysis you know, JP Morgan has like 500 people in their TA department that provides research to their internal traders only. Um, yeah. But when you talk to a, a JP Morgan financial advisor, you know, they, they kind of laugh at technical analysis. They're like, what, you draw a line edge mm -hmm. and you think it's going to just do something because of that? Um, and I find yeah. this interesting, uh, you know, that, that they downplay it, but then, you know, in the back room are using it themselves, right? Yeah, it's actually it's actually very interesting, just like you said, because, you know, people would say that TA doesn't work, but, uh, you know, 
uh, as a matter of fact, if if some people cannot really have, you know comprehend mathematics, you know some basic physical laws, they would say that physics or maths that don't work either, right? So mm-hmm. it's more about uh, getting deeper into the actual sort of like field of knowledge and mastering that. It's the Dunning Kruger effect, I think. Um, you know, you, you well, think you're an expert fundamentally or whatever, and you know, you learn. That there's you're not this learning expert. curve. Yeah. Yep. So I'm curious. Um, do you dabble in any other assets or just crypto? Yeah, actually go way beyond crypto itself. Uh, crypto, you know, I, over the time, I actually become more and more sort of like risk averse to some t- to some uh, extent because of, of my equity growth, right? And uh, the more that equity, equity curve goes up, uh, I, need to pre- I need to focus on protecting my capital much more than keeping, you know, just all the time exposed to risk, right? Agreed. So uh, I actually invest a lot in, in the commodities, you know, gold and silver in the physical form, the bullion, you know, bullion coins, the bars as well. Um, I'm actually uh, also, also into real estate, of course, but you, you wouldn't really ever just give as big returns as crypto, you know, but it's all about actually balancing and diversifying the portfolio in the very the healthy manner so that you are, you can, you can profit from all the markets, but uh, but you're not necessarily heavily exposed, you know, or too heavily exposed. Having said that, still, majority of my money is, is in cryptocurrencies because we're in the bull market and that's what I believe my money should be in right now. Got it. Do you tend to, um, do you tend to day trade or, or are you more of like a position? It sounds more like you're a position trader where you build big positions and then you, you hold them for a while. What's your style of trading? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, it would actually depend on the market, right? Okay. Uh, I'm mostly I'm mostly between uh, the medium time frame swing trader, right? What I base my swing uh, based, you know, on the on the trend following basis or the momentum itself. Uh, and you know, for example, for the for the commodity markets for gold and silver, you know, which are supposed to be hedged against the inflation for coming years, I'm not nowhere near just planning to sell it, you know, anywhere between, uh, you know, within next two three years, right? So. Depending on the market, I would have pretty much like a different strategy. And for crypto itself, I tend to play because of the high risk and high returns, uh, the medium to time frame swings. I, I tend to cash out, you know, on the secondary corrections, just like I did at the, you know, 41.5 per Bitcoin. And then I waited through the entire correction. And uh, when I got, you know, just these, uh, my, my, my own sort of like a training system, which is called Derbicator Pro, uh, flashed the buy signal. I just loaded in heavily because I trust that limitlessly. So... <laughs> Uh, yeah, and I'm just enjoying current current Bitcoin go, uh, going ongoing pumps. It it is uh, it is definitely pumping. Um, for for those watching, we're we're filming this on Monday, uh, uh, February eighth, and uh, Bitcoin's at all all time highs. So, um, so uh, you mentioned uh, the Burbicator, um, and I'm personally very curious about it. Um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your indicator and how it works. Yeah, of course. So. Uh, the main sort of like point and the emphasis on the Burbicator Pro is put that this is not an indicator itself. This is a complete trading system, right? Okay. And the trading system actually consists of a couple of indicators. And uh, if those who are those who are, to those who are actually watching that, you know, if you know uh, Ichimoku, for example, then Burbicator Pro is just like another invention. You know, this is not an Ichimoku. This is not Bollinger Bands. This is not pretty much like you know just just a simple momentum basics. Uh, it's actually developed out of these, but to a completely new standalone trading system, right? So the way that there used to be, there are pretty much like the Bollinger Band system, the Moving Averages system, the Ichimoku system, and there is also the Burbicator Pro system. It. And uh, it is developed, you know, from the Burbicato, which is uh, which is my my sort of like a prior uh, indicator, which was uh, based on the Ichimoku basics of the Tenkan and Kijun oscillations for the momentum and the stochastics. Uh, you know, which which was combined, you know, to be trend following, sort of like mix between trend following and the momentum indicator. And here, you know, the Burbicator Pro provides uh, the, the buy sell signals, I mean, the, the entries, exits, the take profit levels, the targets, you know, by Fibonacci based, uh, the actual DVA, standard deviation bands, you know, on a similar basis to Bollinger Bands, but in a more complex, complete way. Uh, yeah, so this is a very complete standalone trading system, which I actually fall in love with. Uh, it's It's pretty amazing. 
That's really cool. For those watching, um, we'll put in the description below a link to uh, Adrian's Twitter and uh, his website if you want to go explore and learn a little bit about the Burbicator Pro and, um, you know, get to know Adrian a little bit. Um, so, uh, you know, I think we're running, uh, running out of time here. I'm going to get yelled at if I, if I, uh, keep going here for too much longer. So I'm going to move on to my very last question. Um, mm -hmm. and I ask everybody this question, uh, because I think this is uh, one that brings a lot of value to, to, especially the newer traders who watch the show. Um, what advice would you give someone who's brand new to trading, you know, never traded before and they want to get into it? What would you tell them? Yeah, about? that, yeah, that's a, that's a perfect question. And uh, the first, I'm a big fan of theory over the practice in the very first place, right? So I would say study. I would say go and do your own research, of course, which is what majority of the people don't ever do because they're too lazy, which is exactly the reason for their losing the money. Absolutely. So uh, I say go and counter trade your laziness, right? Counter do, counteract your laziness. Go reach out to the books. Go to the best best sources. You know, and even like some people say that you learn by practice. And by spending money on leverage, you know, by just practicing with real money, that's that's bullshit, right? And I say, you can you can do in profit so much better if you put those fifty bucks, you know, in a good book, right, and or in a good course or in a good, like you know, uh, training material, software, whatever, rather than just putting in, you know, and giving away uh, in, the, in the form of fees or commissions to the, to the market, right, to the feeding feeding the exchange itself. So study. That's that's my main message. Okay. That's a good message. Um, and I think a lot of traders, I mean, I did this when I first started, right? The first thing I did was I, I signed up for some simulator, right? And then the next thing I did is I, you know, made a ton of fake money in the simulator and I thought I can go trade futures now, right? And then, then I got destroyed in about 15 minutes, right? When I first started. Yeah, we trading. all know that. Yeah. So, we've, we've all been there. We've all been there. <laughs> yep. But um, you're right. It was laziness, right? And, um, you know, it was this Dunning-Kruger arrogance where you think you know everything from a small amount of exposure and then you realize you know nothing. So, it's also called the first timer's luck to some extent. Yeah, because I had no luck. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. all right, cool. Well, thank you, Adrian, for being here. Um, we're going to wrap up and I'm going to pass this back to Jake uh, for the next segment. And, um, you know, we hope you'll be on again one day. Yeah, I appreciate it very much. Thanks. Thank you. Alrighty, let's look at the broad markets into the last week of February. Starting with SPY, we have the daily on the left, we have the weekly on the right. And um, talk about a wasted week. I mean, absolutely really nothing um, as far as price action to one direction. We pretty much just chopped around, tried to gap up on uh, February 16th, and then just continued to move down, bounced off the volume shelf, and now we're pretty much stuck at it going into the week ahead. Now, on the weekly side of things, you can see here that we talked about this area of potential support last week. You can see that we had a pretty strong candle on the weekly side last week with that big move up into the close on Friday, and then pretty much just completely um, erased that whole candle um, this week. So you can see here that technically we do have this, uh, you know, this outside bar here, pretty much taking out this previous high and this previous low from uh, the, the top and the bottom here. Now, the question is, is this just going to be another candle that just gets uh, completely ignored and we rip higher into the 400s in the coming weeks? Um, I don't know. That's not my job to uh, predict. We just have to see what the charts are telling us. And in this case, with this anchored volume by price from the January low, we do have the volume shelf that we really need to keep an eye on. And then if we did break down through that, the anchored view at from the swing low is around 384, 385. And uh, we'll just have to see if that is the next level tested blow if we do break this shelf. Now, going into the queues, um, pretty similar chart here. Um, you know, not, not a lot of difference other than the fact that we've already tested the swing low anchored VWAP from the January 29th uh, swing low here. So you can see here, we've actually tested both this swing low anchored VWAP and this handoff anchored VWAP. So, um, you know, definitely something that uh, that did have some trouble with on Friday breaking through the shelf. Notice that on um, on the on the SPY chart, this area acted more as a level for price to bounce. In this case, the last uh, two days of the week, you actually had this area above acting as a level of supply. Remember, anytime the price is below one of these shelves, it's going to initially act as a supply zone. That's exactly what it did on Thursday and Friday. Now, on the weekly side of things, you can see here that we were looking at this 1.618 extension that we broke through last week. 
And then we pretty much bounced um, right at that level this week. And uh, you can see here that we have a little bit of a wick. But all in all, this is really not the most bullish um, candle. However, this also looked like a very um, bullish candle last week. And we've got this set up. So we'll just have to see if this 1.618 extension holds. And, uh, you know, if it does and we continue to move up, we always have that 2.618 extension on the longer term side of things to look at. But all in all, uh, really not a ton of action here this week for at least the bulls. Uh, the bears had a little bit of a good time. Um, the IWM chart is, is looking kind of similar to that QQQ chart where, you know, the price was below the shelf. As we moved back up to this area, all of these shares now went to back to break even. A lot of people um, started taking profits here, or excuse me, started uh, breaking even here, which essentially means that, you know, they dealt with a drawdown, price gets back to where they started, and they, they just take, take their money off the table and either go cash or move it somewhere else. So in this case, you'll see here that uh, we do have a little bit of a wick here that we did try to penetrate through and then pretty much just pulled right back into Friday's close. We did hold the anchored view up though from the swing low. So that's something to consider. And it's just interesting that the Qs and IWM touched this area, but SPY didn't get anywhere near that anchored uh, view up from the swing low. So um, on the weekly side of things, we've got this, you know, pretty much since uh, the elections were over, we've got this broadening formation here. If we did continue down into next week, you simply just create an alert at this line Maybe you simply just want the price to break through it. If that's the case, you wouldn't need to use any sensitivity. You would just use this breakthrough trigger here. If you wanted sensitivity, you can move this around. You would then use the touch trigger, which means that anytime the price touches anywhere within this purple area, that's when you'll be alerted. So there's a lot of different ways to use the alert system. So you don't have to stare at the charts all day. You just set your parameters, your boundaries, and then let the system tell you when those are hit. So, uh, IWM, we're kind of stuck in the middle of this uh, broadening formation, and we've got this supply zone above into next week. Uh, we are going to do a couple bonus uh, tickers here. We're going to do XBI, which is the biotech ETF. If we anchor the volume by price from the swing low from January 4th, you'll see that we really had quite a move down over the last two weeks, pretty much uh, almost a 10% move down with the, when the market pretty much didn't move at all, um, or it pretty much just kind of netted uh, it, it, the last two weeks, we really didn't move um, where this definitely had some direction. In this case, you can see here on the weekly side of things, we're getting back down to this um, support zone below. And uh, we do have all of this volume now back to break even. So remember when the price is above a volume shelf and it moves down, then once the price gets back down to where a lot of people are holding at break even at one of these shelves, supply dries up and the price is able to bounce sometimes just because supply is drying up, not because a bunch of buyers stepped in. So in this case, we do have this wick here. It's probably worth noting, you know, what's going on within the raindrop. Was there volume at the top of the range? Is it flat? In this case, it's completely flat. So that tells us that within this wick, within that intraday price action, there was not a lot of conviction by buyers here. And so if I zoom that in, you'll see anytime you have a raindrop like that, if you know, if you have a wick and then you have the raindrop showing no volume profile within that wick, we know there wasn't a lot of conviction by buyers and definitely not the strongest move into the week ahead. Now into uh, DIA, this is the Dow Jones ETF. Um, you can see here that we do have this broadening formation on the weekly side as well. This is one that actually held the volume shelf pretty well. So if we anchor the volume by price and simply I'm just moving this to this swing low on January 29th, you know, we were talking about this being potentially a launch pad, and uh, we definitely had a failed launch um, this, this past week. And you can see that we are now kind of hanging out right on that shelf. So we'll have to see if this holds. This isn't the most bullish uh, weekly candle, but as I mentioned, uh, when we looked at the SPY candle, that looked like a really strong candle into the week ahead, and we, we got a pretty bearish candle. So who knows? We could just melt up to test this area above. You create an alert. And then you you just set your alert, and if it if it hits, then you know it's time to get back to the chart. If not, maybe you set another alert below, whether that's an anchored VWAP. If we anchor the VWAP down here, that would be around 310. Remember, as time moves on and price action and volume occur, this VWAP will change. But for now, that's around let's say 310 or three the 310 zone. Going into uh, VIX, this thing is one of the more boring charts 
out there. And remember, it's hard to really chart VIX, but it's always good to just see what it's looking like. We still have the gap below. Um, we already filled this gap above almost perfectly. Some people would say that's just a coincidence and gaps really don't matter on VIX. I think they do. Um, everybody's looking at a chart and it's just an area that, that people are watching. Um, but all in all, it's the VIX is not something you really want to look too much at into the chart. Um, you know, there's really not much to say other than that gap below and that gap below, who knows how long it will take to fill. Um, this, this thing's just kind of been chopping around now for months. We did have that bounce in late January, but it just quickly, um, was just faded and we now have a new gap above. So this is something that I didn't mention, but we do have this gap above around 29. Um, so it's, uh, it's just levels that may be of interest above. It doesn't mean that, you know, VIX has to fill a gap. It just really means that these are levels that technicians likely are looking at. Even if the VIX doesn't really matter with charts, it's still something people have levels on. So um, that is the broad markets. Hopefully you guys enjoyed a couple extra um, stock tickers in this particular segment. Now let's move on to the next one. Alrighty, let's look at some charts with possibly one of the funnier guys I know in this industry, Mike, who's the founder of Market Traders TV. And uh, Mike, love always talking with you and just talking stocks and excited to see what you have um, going on today with some of these watch list picks. And if you want to explain a little bit about what Market Traders TV is before we jump right in, um, you can do that or we can just get right, get right going and get started. Sure, Jake. Thanks so much for having me. So my name is Mike from Market Traders TV. We do a live stream on Twitch called Market Traders TV. We are live 24-7 and we do technical analysis on charts. And our motto is we teach people how to trade the markets, make money and be happy. Yeah. So I have a few things to look at today. First one I want to look at was Tesla. So we have Tesla here on the screen. Everything's good there to go, right? Yes. So one of the things I like about Tesla here is that we actually started today by breaking the swing low. So one of the things I like to look for in the market is in an uptrend, when we lose a level, we like to look for that level to then either hold, which they tried to do today, you notice this closing candle here, or if they break it, we look for the next level. We call it a failure, right? So if they do it due to a failure of the trend, we like to look at the next level that could be potentially held. And Tesla's a pretty interesting one here because obviously Tesla's been in a massive uptrend. It's this thing has been skyrocketing. But the thing that is interesting to me on Tesla is if we actually get down below this range, we have a couple of little gappers here, but if we get down below this range, I'm going to be interested in a Tesla long somewhere right around here. Previous all-time high to the swing. Mm -hmm. Right in here. So this this range has not been revisited. This um, 652 marker has not been revisited since we've been here, right? We have not tested this yet. So that'll be an area of interest for me on Tesla. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's pretty much it on this one. Um, obviously, if they do hold this up range at 780, then we're going to go retest pretty straightforward we're going to retest the move that made this this local swing right and then it would be new all-time high but um when you're looking at these these um setups are you taking into account any catalyst fundamental thesis or really just price action so i actually prefer not to even know what the company does that i'm looking at the chart for because yep. i i'm not a i'm you know, we're all humans. We all have bias. We all have, you know, um, emotional attachment to things. Obviously, we know what Tesla does, and all those things. But <laughs> um, I like I like tickers where I don't even know what the hell the company does. That's the, because that keeps me chart focused, and I look at nothing else. So I personally don't pay attention to news. I do read the news, but I don't pay attention to it for financials. I, I obviously read Twitter, but I don't pay attention to financials. The chart for me is the gospel, and everything else is a false prophet. That's the yeah. way I look at it. Makes sense to me. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, do remember, you have any I remember learning in college, you know, in, in some class, they're like a chartist, you know, they had a definition. They're like, most chartists don't even know what the company does. And it's like, it's so, it's so uh, true. I mean, you know, a lot of these people who are trading get so 
wrapped up in the story of the stock that they're in that, you know, they just ignore the price action. It's like, well, then why are you even using a chart? So, yep. um, you know, I, I just love that you mentioned that you really don't even care what they do. It's all about the chart and price action. Mm -hmm. So did you have any, uh, anything else specific on this one you wanted to go over? Do you, does this premise make sense? Make, hey, makes sense to me. Are you, yeah, so, when you're looking at stuff, are you generally looking at the daily or are you also looking at some of the longer term candles or just mostly daily is your primary time frame? So everything I do is start at monthly. I look at monthly swings, weekly, look at weekly swings, go to daily, look at daily swings. And then sometimes it's worthwhile to um, dig in around the four hour time frame to see if there was something specifically untested in the, in the range. But Pretty much um, just daily swings, as long as you can identify a proper stop loss. And what I like to do for my trades is first PT, at least three R. That's that's mm -hmm. kind of my motto. Um, I like to have at least three profit targets, but first first one being around three R, especially in in trading with trend. Obviously, this would be a, a long trend trade on, on Tesla and is up. Um, so be looking for three R on the first PT and then second be higher than all the swings above but as long as i can identify a spot that gives me a good stop loss with around one percent risk of my accounts total account size right if i, if I get stopped i lose one percent of my account i'll take the trade that's okay. that's that's pretty much how we do it okay makes sense to me and just for those that are wondering what three r means it means essentially three three times your risk yep you're risking one to make three Yep. Yep. All right. So the next one I want to look at is another popular one. It's Apple. Oh, Apple. Good old Apple. Everyone's, everyone's favorite Apple. Um, Apple. Oops, I should get rid of these markers. Um, actually, those are proper. Um, Apple is, I was just trying to heat map to see where the where we are. So one thing I love about um trying is this heat map. See, I love this thing. We should we should actually keep this on. Um so Apple's kind of the same as Tesla here. You'll notice that we are starting to lose the move that made the all-time high. Mm -hmm. And today we closed, we did, we did technically close above it, but we're starting to lose it. So when we do lose the move that make the high, this is the all-time high on Apple up here, that we can look for the next untested level lower. And you can use the trend spider heat map for this. It's just, it's it's so freaking great. But you'll notice where the next heat map level is. And I actually already had the level the level done here on the chart, but the next level down that we're looking for is right around 115. It's this move that made the swing low in this range that that created the move that made the high, and the heat map also lines it up right there. So this is another thing on Apple that we're looking for for a long, and our stop loss is fairly simple. And just eyeballing it, this would be a, a pretty easy three R to first PT idea here. So what we're looking for is a close below this 130 marker. Mm -hmm. basically lose this swing around 127 if we lose this 127 we're looking right where the heat map is just slightly below it makes sense. if we lose this whole range then we have the heat map tells us all the way down here as well that we're looking at 93 now this probably won't happen in apple uh, this would be a um, major major market sell-off you know, if we do get a, um, a big dump in the nq then we'd be looking at 90 93 ish on apple but i like the 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 level around 115 because we haven't revisited we haven't tested it and oh my phone's ringing sorry but that's that's pretty much the idea if we, if we don't get it we don't get it but if we do we're going to take it right around 115 makes sense and you mentioned uh last chart gaps so are you looking at gaps and which gaps have filled which ones haven't that type of thing we do because a gap is um is the definition of an untested level because price has never been back there. But the only time that matters for me is if the gap lines up with the level. So mm -hmm. if, if the random gap, it's just a random gap. But if the gap lines up with a swing low, then it's more powerful because it's the price has never been back there. And one of the ideas we like is the idea of a first, first retest or a first touch, as they say. And um, that's the highest probability idea of a trade is the, the first retest of a first touch. So um, gaps are only important in that regard. Another, another big thing is um, the only time we look for these things is if we have failure, which mm -hmm. is that what Apple, Apple and Tesla are setting up right now, setting up a failure. If there is no failure, there is no retest. So that's, that's how we, um, we kind of 
plan our ideas out. We, I wouldn't even be paying attention to Apple if we weren't actually f- trying to fail this move that made the all-time high, which is what we're trying to do here. Makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. Cool. Well, what's what's our next uh, victim here on the charts? So this one's one that probably most people don't know. It's actually Unity Software. Mm-hmm. Yep. And oh, we're getting no more data on this one. So the interesting thing about this is this this little doggy has already lost the move twice that made the high. So initially, this is the move that made the all-time high or this high this high that was created here, right? We lost it. We actually retested it. And this is an idea of a short. We retested it right here. Took a little bit of short, but not much. And now we have broken down, gapped down, and we're testing lower. So... This is a great example of something that we need to look for the next untested range. And we have a spot that's coming up on right now, this previous swing high, it was produced here. And it's actually super close to it. This is, this is one of the ones that would be potentially a trade idea for tomorrow, but it's this range in unity right here that we're, that we're entering in. Now, the, the thing I don't really like about this one as much is the stop loss is a little bit a little bit more difficult. So this would be better for an option trade idea. Mm-hmm. I don't know if the option trade on Unity is 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 liquid or great, but the this the actual stop loss on a common stock here would be a little bit rough, but you could still get let's just delete this. You could probably still get a good three hour trade if you were targeting this swing right by this gap. So if you let's just say you had your stop somewhere in this range. That would be a pretty pretty great trade. So this is I one that we're this, looking for soon. I think this is one that, um, and you know, over the last year, I've never seen someone's buys and sells become such a public news event. So Kathleen Wood, everyone knows her. Uh, she she runs the Arc Fund, and it's been interesting to see a lot of these stocks that she has been entering have really been getting faded. And it's almost like you have so many retail traders that are blindly following anything that's updated on her end of day um, buys and sells. It's almost like the trade, uh, the trade, the trade is becoming overcrowded because so many people are just blindly following these things. Um, and it's it's been interesting to see. I think last week I saw a lot of people mentioning that you know on that gap down. Uh, that uh, Arc was was adding, and you know, it just keeps melting. And I know Arc has different timeframes, but it's interesting to see that a lot of people are entering these trades immediately, thinking it's going to reverse because she got in. And at first, it kind of was like that, and now it seems that these are almost getting faded. Uh, PLTR is another example of this um, over the last couple of days. So um, it is interesting to see that she's in this one, and it has kind of continued to kind of bleed. Uh, down to levels that a lot of people didn't think it could get down to. I didn't even know that this was one of the ones that she had, is it? Unity software? Yeah, I, I, I think uh, on the gap down or the day after, somebody posted that she had added a bunch of shares and, you know, it, it, was, <laughs> it, was, uh, it was down, but she was adding. And um, it's always interesting to see that, you know, some, some, you know, Warren Buffett, you know, he used to be the guy. If, if he got in something, the market was just all on it. And now it's her and, um, it's just interesting to see how the market moves to different people and follows them. And then sometimes um, too many people follow, the trade becomes overcrowded and you almost have to have a reset capitulation to get all those people out who blindly followed her. <laughs> mm-hmm. Absolutely. So um, so I like this one. Um, you know, uh, I love the fact that you're just really using horizontal levels, keeping the chart clean, because at the end of the day, price action is really the only thing that matters. So mm-hmm. um Unity, uh, this is one that uh, really has been beaten down. It has a gap above. What is the next one we're taking a look at? So I wanted to show two more, the ones we actually took, and show you the the rationale behind them. Perfect. So this is one that we took on our live stream. And let me see exactly where it was. Yeah, right here. So this thing, I once again, I idea what this company does, but um, they... (laughs) <laughs> I love it. I love it. They produced this low, the low around the 51 marker, 
and then they they bridge the gap up and then gain and test a high swing. And then what they did after that, when they lost the level that, that created it, which is here, they basically did it right here. They, will, they go and test the trend. And this is a, a perfect example, of basically a trend start rest, the absolute low. And we got this swing right here. So we, we take it, we ignore this middle part, we ignore this. And we take it based off of this previous trend. And you'll notice right here, this is our entry. We got in exactly at um, 55.24. So my line's a little bit off. It's actually 55.29, but we got in. And we're looking for, so first PT, which we didn't actually take, but first PT would be this move that made the high, which they did today. Mm -hmm. And then the next profit target on this one, it would be this swing that made the actual high right here. So this one's been a, been a pretty good banger. Um, and I just wanted to show the the rationale about things we kind of the way that we kind of look at the to take, and some of them some of them turn out to be pretty pretty perfect like this. And I also like where the heat map is on it. Heat map liked it here. We took it here. Heat map says yes, we like it here. Heat map says we like it here. I like that confluence, and um, I think even re-adding this position around fifty eight. A retest of where this actually is right here. Get a bad idea. Right around that kind of the near that low or that gap, uh, previous gap. Around 58, 50, the move, the move that made this swing low around here. We're right where the heat map is. Yep. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense to me. It makes sense to me. And it also makes sense that they would uh they would kind of capitulate below that previous uh, 55, 24 area before you guys entered. Because if too many people are watching a, uh, watching a level, I mean, it's, it's guaranteed to fail because everybody's watching it. And then as soon as it breaks, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Everybody gets out and it just becomes a whole, a whole new thing. So um, yeah, I love that you mentioned that you know, sometimes you just got to ignore those moves because they're just capitulation moves and um, they, they're not always, you know, the main thing to focus on. So mm -hmm. I just wanted to mention that. Yeah, liquidity runs, you know, people call them stop hunts, although whatever jargon you want to play side of. But yeah, this is one of the things I really like to look at these type of setups. Um, um, there's, there's, a, there's a technical name for it that I actually can't go into. I probably shouldn't borrow it up. But anyways, the last one I had was Coke. Coca-Cola. Another thing that we're in. Um, get rid of that. So we took Coke from 4817, which was this gap right here. And this is the same type of setup that we had in that FCSS stuff. We produce a high. And turn the heat map off of this so you can see it better. We produce the high, we lose the high, we retest the move that made the high, which is exactly there. Mm -hmm. And this provided a very easy stop loss. You could stop, you could stop at range, you could stop below range, you know, somewhere in there. It doesn't really matter where you do that. But very good R on this one, because what our first profit target would be is this actual move that produced the local high. So we got in this one here, and we're looking for that. And just another pretty simple setup. Um my favorite types of setups are these gap plus level a gap right here gap plus level retest gap do it boom boom bang bang go i have Pretty a straightforward I have, stuff i have a little uh trend spider hack for you if you wanted to on your live stream ever show the exact levels that you entered just double click on that 4813 mm -hmm. line you can just type it in yep yep for yeah, those those that aren't familiar with that, because that is something we added after the fact. Um, so if you did want to be really precise, you can go in and, and type it in, and it will it will make it perfect for you. But these are these are great, and I think it I think this really highlights just really great price action trading. There's not a lot of trend lines. There's not a lot of indicators. You don't have moving averages. You're just looking at price action. And um, you know that's that's really what's driving the markets is just price action, supply and demand, um, and and all that fun stuff. So um, really appreciate you kind of making it um, 
not it's not simple, but it looks simple the way you present it because it's just uh, very easy to read and understand levels. And um, you know, really appreciate you coming on and and sharing your thoughts on these things. And um, really looking forward to seeing how all of these play out. I personally think Tesla. It, it looks it looks pretty rough to me. I mean, um, today's today's candle. We we did the recording on on Wednesday, so you know we're when this goes live on Sunday. You, uh, you know, we'll see what the candle looks like then. But, you know, today's candle on Wednesday looked decent, but just, oh man, almost talk about just almost a crowded trade again. Everybody is, uh, everybody was just so bullish on Tesla and then it's just chopped around. Everyone thinks, oh, Tesla buys Bitcoin. Tesla's going to go, you know, up more and it's just kind of done opposite. So, um, it was, it was, that was very interesting to see how they moved, uh, Bitcoin by adding that to their balance sheet. But, yeah. Um, it, it didn't it didn't hurt bitcoin that's for sure <laughs> yeah a lot of people on my live stream took this the short on tesla here at this retest of the high at eight eight eighty or whatever nice. a lot of people did that they're they're looking pretty good but i i do like this as a long idea this it's a you know, obviously we're at 800 and we're looking for it to get down to around 650 so it's a big move right but if we get it on tesla then we'll we'll see but you know like i said earlier if they if you know they did close above the level they need to so they could they could go back and retest now but if they do start closing blue then opportunity is abound opportunity is abound i like that <laughs> well mike thank you so much for coming on uh for those that are interested in checking out mike's 24-hour stream it's just market traders tv um they have a huge audience on twitch um they also have uh a, a audience as well um big audience on twitter but they're not live on twitter they're they're live on twitch so if you don't want to check them out um, I always like uh, the little videos that you're playing in the background. Sometimes uh, I remember that one time I I, I came on the uh, I came on the stream and it was just somebody roller skating and literally <laughs> that, was, that was literally one of the calmest videos I've ever seen. I was like, man, this is like this is like anti anxiety type of uh, video. Like just it was it was just funny that like something like a video of somebody roller skating just like put me in such a zen mode. So. Um, definitely check it out. Market Traders TV. Mike, any last words before we go? I did actually recently add a webcam to it. People have said, Mike, you got to put your face on there. So I did that a webcam. So it's not always the roller skating girl. Sometimes it's my ugly mug. So join me on the stream. Thanks so much guys for having me. I love your product and Eddie, thanks for thank all the help. So I, I love, uh, I love how you utilize the heat maps and just to integrate it with your horizontal levels and price action, uh, way of trading. And uh, looking forward to having you on again soon. And um, I appreciate you having me on a couple, what, a month ago or so when we did the live stream on your side. So we need to we do that again. Hey, would love to anytime. So uh, you guys know where to check us out next time, uh, maybe on Twitch, Market Traders TV. Thanks so much, Mike. And let's move on to the next segment. All righty. Into the chart request, we have five different stocks we're looking at, starting with Apple um, Apple is an interesting one. So there's a couple different things to note here. So we have this uh, swing low here from September 21st. And what I've done is I've pretty much anchored in a VWAP from all of these uh, different swing lows. And you can see how well on February 17th, we bounced right at this, uh, this previous swing or the last swing low anchored VWAP. The next day we bounced right at the swing low from uh, November 2nd. And then the swing low from September 21st has not been tested yet. Now, if we anchor the volume by price from that same original um, low, this capitulation point, you can see here that the price was able to drop very quickly through this area because there wasn't a lot of liquidity below until we got to, let's say, 128, 129. You can see that this gray or this gray, this orange box is showing us that there's not a lot of gray bars there. It's, it's, you notice how it kind of uh, just, it lightens up a lot. So the fact that we have this kind of hole in liquidity allowed price to drop very quickly um, in the past week. And then we finally were able to uh, bounce a little bit at this next shelf below. Now, one thing about Apple that I wanna point out here is we are at this longer term level of potential support. Notice this is a zone rather than just one um, trend line. Uh, it will be interesting to see if we do break down through this because that would really um, maybe get some people going because I'm sure I'm not the only one that sees this particular setup. Um, but all in all, 
the one thing I want to point out here is also seasonality. I'm going to be touching on seasonality for all the different stocks in this segment, mainly because we're getting into the last month of, or the last week of February going into the month of March. And we really want to get an idea of what, what does March look like? In this case, March and April are 50% win rates over the last five years. Literally no edge in seasonality at all. You can see here in May, we've got a, a pretty big move up uh, as far as win rates go. And then June drops off a cliff. And remember, seasonality is an, in, you know, something that's an end-all be-all. You can have an 83% win rate in May and still close red. It's just showing that over the last five years, that it's been pretty strong. Going into March and April, there's really no edge at all. It's just 50% win rate um, since, uh, since 2015. So um, that's something to keep in mind. However, I also want to mention the day of the week seasonality since the uh, coronavirus bottom, let's say the beginning of April is late March, early April. You'll see that Mondays do have a 76% win rate. So we do have you know price kind of forming this higher low here on Friday. And you can see that we do have the gap above. Just as easily as price was able to move down through this volume gap, it can just move. Uh, it can move just as easily back up through it. So, you know, if we did catch a little bit of a bid and start to move up, there's not a lot of break-even holders. Let's say that are holding at a drawdown until we get back to 135, 136 area. So, Apple day-to-day um, -day seasonality into Monday is pretty strong, but overall, the monthly seasonality into March is is literally there's no edge at all. Going into BLNK, this is one that definitely uh, has, has been moving up quite a bit. It's kind of stalling over the last few weeks. You can see that on Thursday and Friday, we did have a nice bounce off this point of control dashed volume shelf. Uh, the point of control is always your, your biggest volume node here, but you can see that this these other two nodes at the above and below that kind of create this shelf, and that's where price uh, pretty much stuck at the end of the week. Now, on the Weekly side of things, you can see we do have kind of this rounded top formation. We'll have to see if that uh, means anything or that's just a setup that kind of is showing um, something for now. I mean, this could easily just rip to the upside and the, the rounded top is completely invalidated. Um, now, since, uh, since the coronavirus bottom early uh, April, late March, Monday has a 48% win rate. Tuesday has the highest win rate of 61%. Um, now, let's go to... Uh, 2015, starting in 2015 and go to the month of the year, uh, you'll see that March only has a 17% win rate um, over the last five years. So that's something to consider when looking at maybe going into a swing position into March. Doesn't mean that BLNK cannot close green for March, but it does tell us that there hasn't been historically great price action for bulls during this particular month. So um, you can see here that February, we're also seeing that, um, you know, it's, it's not the strongest month. It, it pretty significantly declines from 86% win rate in January. Um, so just keep that in mind. Um, it's, it's just another variable to add to the equation. You can see here that we have this uh, anchor view app from the October 28th low. And then we have this handoff. Remember, a handoff is just the last candle to touch the original anchor view app. We anchor another view app. And that was really right in line with this point of control dash volume shelf um, going into the week ahead. Now going into DKNG, uh, Donkey Kong, DraftKings, whatever you want to call this, um, you have the swing low that we want to anchor the volume by price in the anchored view app from on January 5th. You'll see here that we had trouble breaking through that on Friday. You can see here that we do have this wick. This is when we want to turn on the raindrop, see if there was any significant volume within that wick. Uh, a little bit, but not a ton. Generally, I would want to see, you know, a majority of volume. Uh, let's see. Do this a little smaller. So you would want to see a lot of that volume at the top of the range, kind of like a bulge here. And you have a little bit, but not a ton. If, if this was really something uh, that, that was a little stronger, it may look interesting. But all in all, we do have not a lot of volume in that wick. So if we turn this back to the hollow candle here, you know, we, we're pretty much just closed right at that swing high anchored view app. Now on the weekly side of things, we do have this ascending triangle that's worth noting, a pretty strong hammer as well on the weekly side of things. And if we look at the uh, seasonality month, 
the monthly is not going to do anything because DKNG hasn't been around that long. Let's go to the day of the week since uh, the, the COVID lows. And same thing, Monday has a 48% win rate. So as far as seasonality goes, there's not a ton of an edge um, for DKNG, at least looking at, you know, does, does Monday have a significantly higher win rate than Friday or anything like that? Interestingly enough, Wednesday has a 66% win rate, which is actually pretty dramatically um, different from uh, Monday going into the week ahead with only a 48% win rate. Going into uh, NNDM, uh, this has been a hot name. A lot of people have been bringing this up. Um, it's pretty interesting because I really hadn't heard of it um, too much before the last week or so. And same thing, right? The price was below that area on Thursday at 13.55 or so. Price tried to go back up into this area. It's going to act as a supply zone for now because remember, these shares are now back to break even. Some people are going to exit and move on. That adds to the supply, and that's why we have this wick like we do. Now, if we get above this area, let's say around 15, this becomes a potential launch pad for price. But for now, you can see that we barely missed the anchor VWAP um, from this handoff point on January 6th. Um, so if we did continue down, uh, you could make this a level to watch. Just right click, create an alert. If you wanted to have some sensitivity around there, you can. Or if you just want the price to actually break through that line, you click breakthrough. And if you want to use the sensitivity, make sure to use touch. So um, that's how you can set yourself up for uh, next week, getting ready for these levels that could be potentially tested above and below. And then on the weekly side of things, you'll see here that we do have this ascending wedge here that actually broke down. Price just gapped right below the support line. And you can see, same thing. There's, there's not a ton of uh, edge on the seasonality side on the day of the week. But if we go to the month of the year, you know, since this is such a new stock, um, since uh, September of 2015, we can't do it since January. But you'll see here that, you know, March, March and April are not, they don't have any type of real edge. I mean, you do have a little bit of a spike in seasonality in May and then in September with 60% win rates. But um, for now, you know, these, these aren't showing any type of high win rates like sometimes like we see with Apple, as I mentioned, a 76% win rate into Monday since um, you know, coronavirus, that's, that's something worth noting. Um, so this seasonality is really good to just see, you know, are the technicals aligning with a, a bullish seasonal trend or anything like that? And you, remember, this isn't just for position traders, maybe looking at the monthly, you can go down all the way to the hour of the day, if you're more of a scalper to see if there's a specific time of day. And let's say that maybe since the start of 2021, you know, how has each hour of the day performed? You'll see that, you know, there's some pretty significant discrepancies here. So this seasonality is not just for longer term traders. It's definitely for shorter term traders as well. And uh, just a way to complement your technical analysis. Remember, we also have the bundle package going on with Cheddar Flow right now. So you can even um, add more edge to your trading and your analysis using Cheddar Flow and TrendSpider on the technical side. Um, but if you do want to just try out TrendSpider on its own, we'd have the seven day free trial. You can try out all these different features that I've touched on today. Um, and hopefully this analysis was useful. Remember, this isn't, this is just analysis that I'm doing using the, the platform. Just what I say doesn't, doesn't really have any precedence over anything else. So uh, just uh, take it for what it's worth. And hopefully it's something that adds um, to, to your overall analysis into next week and maybe helps you understand the platform a little better. If you guys have any questions using the platform, you always know where to reach us. Hello at Transpire.com or our Twitter DMs. We're always there answering questions. And I uh, really appreciate everybody tuning in into uh, today's, today's show. And uh, we'll see you next week.